Fresh Tracks Weekly, episode 20. Wow, it's crazy. It seems like we just started this, but episode 20 already. Uh, had a great 4th of July weekend. My wife, Kara, and I met up with some friends and we took the boats out, went fishing and camping. We caught a bunch of little bass, which was a blast. And then I caught my first bull trout, uh, just a juvenile, but that was cool because that was a first for me. All in all, great weekend. But now I gotta check in and see what's going on with Michael. Been chasing the salmon flies, been struggling trying to catch fish on the salmon flies. For those of you who don't know, it's the biggest stone fly that we have in Southwest Montana. These things are huge. Some of them are three, four inches. Actually, that's kind of a lie. Probably like three inches a big one. They come off on a couple of the free stones around here. So the past couple of days, been chasing those with my girlfriend with limited success, but still good times out there seeing the alien creature like bugs uh flying around did manage to film as i was fishing one of those days uh antelope coming across the river that was pretty cool that's some serious bravery right there oh my gosh that's crazy Just no, that's some nature stuff right there. I've never seen a pronghorn swim. And uh, check out these salmon fly nymphs. They're just giant bugs um, coming out of the water. But the rivers are starting to level off here, um, starting to look really good. Yesterday, fished for a little bit and caught, some, caught a few. Hope you enjoy this clip of me catching one in my backyard. Love fishing back there. Um, but the plan for the upcoming week is to head up to one of my favorite rivers, hopefully catch some fish and dry flies. And uh, Marcus and I are going to be out filming for Anything Goes next week. So we'll be having a, another fishing report, hopefully with some carp and, and some trout to show you. So today will be 107. So chipping away at that goal of 200 days in 2022. Back to you, Marcus. On to some news. So some good news in the Northern Great Plains as the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is helping to fund $12.5 million that is gonna to go towards improving grasslands and habitat in Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. These improvements include a lot of different things, including putting conservation easements on private land, restoring wildlife habitat, removing or improving fences that are barriers to wildlife. In total, there are 18 separate awards in which money is getting spread out to. I really like seeing projects completed in grassland ecosystems because I feel like often grasslands are underappreciated. Uh, there's some amazing places and really cool wildlife that live in grasslands. I've been lucky enough in the past to work on various habitat projects and I've worked with sage grouse and black-footed ferrets and I've got to spend a lot of time in these grassland ecosystems and they're really cool. It might not be as breathtaking as like a high mountain peak, but there's something cool about sitting out on an intact landscape, an unaltered grassland. There's not that many left in the scheme of things. And when you're out there, it is pretty cool. There's a diverse set of wildlife. There's a lot going on. And while at a distance, it might look bland and bleak out there, there's a whole ecosystem that, that can be thriving in these unaltered landscapes. So to protect them and to conserve them and restore them is pretty cool. Um, and also there might, you know, there's often some very big mule deer or pronghorn out in some of these areas uh, for, the, for the hunting inclined. Anyway, I'm always a fan of funding conservation, wildlife habitat, et cetera, but I also like to try to wrap my head around where the money comes from. So I find it interesting to try to figure out who the players are, what their motives are, who they're accountable to, et cetera. Just try to figure out, you know, follow the money, I guess. Um, in this case, $5.8 million came from grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and an additional $6.7 million came from grantee matching contributions. So the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is a Congress-founded organization that leverages public funds to raise private dollars. So in the case of the grants I just referred to, these 18 projects that were funded this year, the players consisted of a number of federal government agencies. And then the private players were the Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, which is old money, a hair from the Cargill family. Margaret Cargill was a 
very interested in preserving natural landscapes and conservation. So this fund was created upon her passing and that's where that money came from. So Altria Group is a tobacco company and they allocated money to natural resource conservation because as they state on their website, their business and communities rely on natural resources. The Bezos Earth Fund, which is a commitment from the Amazon founder Jeff Bezos to disperse a grant towards fighting climate change and protecting nature. Also, he probably just has more money than he knows what to do with. Uh, Marathon Oil, which is an oil company, but sets aside money to mitigate the effects of their operations. And then Occidental Petroleum, another oil company that has mitigation money. Uh, and they also go as far as saying that they're trying to have a net zero emission goal in the future. So uh, it's just interesting to see where this, this money comes from. Um, and one thing to note, and I don't know if it was in this case, but a lot of industries and companies are actually required to provide mitigation money for their operations. For instance, if you're a power company that has a dam, you're going to give mitigation money for altering that river system. Um, and sometimes these grants are also just a marketing scheme because you want to maintain a positive image in the public eye. Uh, so there's just a number of things that uh, motivate people to give money. I think it's just kind of a good idea to keep a pulse on it and understand where it's coming from. Regardless, a lot of money is going towards conservation and some good things are getting done in the Northern Great Plains. With hot temperatures, fires are starting to pick up across the United States and Canada. Alaska has already seen a ton already. At the time of recording this, there are 458 active wildfires in Alaska. Crazy. Arizona and New Mexico have some pretty big fires. California has quite a few fires popping up with relatively dry conditions. More are probably on the way. Obviously, wildfires can have an impact on humans, primarily through destroying our structures that we build or putting our lives in danger. But also, I tend to think about how wildfires are going to affect wildlife and their habitat. This is where my mind gravitates towards. I'm not trying to uh, discount any of the dangers the, that come to life and property. Those are very important too, but I'm just speaking to the terms of wildlife and habitat and the effects that fire have on that. So there are a ton of factors that affect how wildfire spreads across the landscape and what it's gonna do, but for years we've suppressed wildfires across huge tracts of land. And it's not like all those trees and shrubs just decompose quickly. The fuel load builds up and there is just a ton of unburned fuel in a lot of area, a lot of public land particularly. Previously, periodic fires would go through and they would reduce the fuel load. And a lot of times these fires were small and certainly there were big fires as well. But uh, because we've suppressed it and fought fires for so many years that this builds up, it builds up. So these small fires that used to occur frequently were often very good for the landscape. Uh, they'd help improve habitat by opening up space and they would create diverse plant life. Uh, it's just kind of a reallocating of the resources, the nutrients in the soil. Don't get me wrong, big fires can sometimes be really good too, but other times it just scorches the earth, it scorches everything, and fires can travel across way bigger tracts of land than they normally used to. Another big kicker though that has been thrown into the system is now we have a lot of invasive species that take over when fires go through. For instance, in the Snake River Basin, cheatgrass is so prevalent that it just dominates the land landscape after a fire goes through and it just makes habitat way worse for pretty much everything. And it's not that like that everywhere, but it's just a whole new factor that comes into play when these fires go through. So there are some really cool efforts and programs of doing prescribed burns and controlled burns to try to get ahead of the problem and reduce fires on the landscape and improve habitat and controlled settings. But when you zoom out and look at the issue at a landscape level, these prescribed burns can only do so much and there are a lot of uh, giant tinder boxes that are just waiting to be burned. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens the rest of the summer um, and years to come as well. I don't know what the answer is, but every year we get these crazy reminders of how brutal nature can be. And just because we've developed an area and it's been developed for 100 years, it doesn't mean that it can't be destroyed in the matter of seconds. Last week I mentioned the Return Act and it was introduced to repeal the Pittman-Robertson Act. This is just a bad idea and hopefully it's not going anywhere. But we're going to use this week's deeper dive to discuss it, but we're also going to go into the history of it and talk about how hunters and shooters were the ones who historically showed up for conservation while others did not. The deeper dive, what's Which, today Marcus? Well, Pittman-Robertson Act, yep. there's, it's in the news because there are there is a bill, an act, the Return Act, to repeal it, Yep. which is hopefully dead in the water, right? I mean... It probably is, but... It, it seems like the writing is on the wall with, when both 
the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the NRA seem to oppose it. And American Wildlife Conservation Partners, AWCP, which is all of the hunting groups. Yeah. They oppose it. Yep. Gotcha. But nonetheless, there was this Andrew Clyde and 53 co-sponsors yeah. to it. So uh, that's anywhere interesting. But uh, I thought that maybe we could go into a little history, a little short mm -hmm. history lesson on the Pittman-Robertson Act, and then yeah. with the hope that this bill is never actually going to go anywhere, uh, talk about the history and then go into the yeah. backpack tax, right. which is a different idea that never took place, and this kind of yeah. an interesting reminder, this whole news cycle and story is kind of an interesting reminder of that. How, what's but, your time frame for a deep dive? Because well, this we, could be we'll a two-hour discussion. We'll try to keep it a little short. Reel me in, then. Yeah, I mean, so the history of the Pittman-Robertson Act was mm -hmm. in the 1930s, right? right. That they yeah. imposed an 11% excise tax on firearms, ammunition, and some, a few other hunting-related equipment. And yep. then dingle Johnson Act followed With on fishing, fishing equipment. That yep. Both have done a ton for wildlife management, and wildlife yep. research, fisheries management, and... Yep. So yep. forth. So it's like largely recognized as incredibly successful programs. Mm -hmm. I feel like most people watching probably have heard about it. They know how successful it is. Right. And it's uh, an excise tax placed on the manufacturer of these goods. Yeah. Certain, certain items used in certain things, here's the excise tax. And the money goes to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where it's re-granted back to the states. And there's mm -hmm. a formula that's somewhat based on uh, population, somewhat based on license sales. So it's not like every state gets the equal amount or per capita. So there is a formula. Yeah. And so... And it's it, usually like, yeah, there's a lot of checks and balances to make sure mm -hmm. it's going towards a good project. Right. The, the program itself is subject to a biannual audit. Mm -hmm. And then each state agency... There are restrictions on what they can use that money for. So their expenditure of the funds that are granted to them get audited. Mm -hmm. So if the rest of the federal government was under this much scrutiny of how the funds get used, people would probably be a whole lot happier about the taxes they pay. Mm -hmm. But this program is heavily scrutinized, which is why I think most people are comfortable with what's it, you know, this billion dollars that the last few years has been re-granted back to state agencies. Right. People are celebrating it, not complaining about it. Yeah, and I think another important history aspect of this is who are the people who advocated and, you know, advocated for this in the 1930s? Right, hunters and shooters. Right. Mm -hmm. they, it was like almost a self-imposed. Yeah, like, and, and that was not the boom times of the 2000s. Right. That was the dirty 30s, the depression. Here comes a group of people that raised their hand and said, you know what, if we're going to have wildlife, if we're going to have shooting facilities, we got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And the best way to pay for it is to impose a tax on the products that we use for that. Yeah. 11%, 10% on some of it. It, it, it just, it's remarkable when you put it in the context of when it happened, the support it has had throughout the years. And here we are, what would this be, 85 years later? And along comes this bill to repeal that un right. under the premise of it's imposing a tax on a constitutional right. Well, this is me getting into it. Manufacturing something is not a constitutional right. So, <laughs> it, there we go. let's not get into that. But yeah, but well, let's go down the tangent of talking about the backpack tax. Because yeah. that was something that came yeah. along and I hope you have a little bit of knowledge oh, about yeah. that. But uh, I thought it was interesting that when you Google the backpack tax, one mm -hmm. of the first things that pops up is the Outdoor Industry Association's uh, stance on it. Well, and it's funny because I remember looking this up in the past, but right now if you click that page, it's just blank, which yeah. I find slightly comical. <laughs> uh, but in the past, it said something to the effect that they already pay enough taxes. Or you remember what it was? Right. like. The, yeah, my first trip to Washington, D.C. in 1998 was under what was called Partners in Wildlife, yeah. which became the, con the Conservation and Reinvestment Act, which got kind of hung the tag on it, the backpack tax. Yeah. One to three percent on tents, backpacks, binoculars, you know, whatever the general outdoor recreation person uses. Mm -hmm. not, not 10 or 11 percent. Yeah, I was going to say, it's significantly less. 1 to 3 percent. Mm -hmm. And the idea was the same thing. It would get granted back to the states. Yeah. And at that time, the deal was, 
if we will sign this, we'll get full and permanent funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which did happen in 2020. Mm -hmm. So for 22 years, we lost all these opportunities to use the Land and Water Conservation Fund because the outdoor recreation industry killed CARA. The, con the Conservation and Reinvestment Act, its first version of a backpack tax in 1998, got killed by right. them. And they have killed every effort since then under the premise that, well, we already pay tariffs. And tariffs are the form of a tax. I'm an accountant. I'm a, I'm a tax accountant, okay? My profession is disinheriting the federal treasury. <laughs> so I know the difference between a tax and a tariff. Yeah. A tariff is something you choose to pay or subject yourself to because you ship your manufacturing overseas. There are hunting companies that have shipped their manufacturing overseas and they pay these same tariffs. Right, and they also pay into the... But Pittman Yeah, but they also pay into Pittman-Robertson. Mm -hmm. So don't feed me the BS that a tariff somehow is your contribution to the impacts your industry, your group of users is imposing on, in this case, federal lands or waters or whatever. Yeah. No, it's interesting. And whether this part is said out loud or not, I feel like one of the common sentiments of, like, you know, argument against the backpack tax or, like, we shouldn't have to pay is, like, well, we're not, and this is speaking from the perspective of, like, a backpacker or hiker. It's like, well, mm -hmm. we're a non-consumptive user. You, you know, we're not... You've dove into that. You know different. We're not, we're not uh, you, know, taking a, you know, taking wildlife off the landscape. We're not taking fish out of the streams, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But that argument, I think, falls apart really quickly because all of the impacts on wildlife, from displacing wildlife on winter ranges, walking your dogs, skiing, like Mountain biking, all that stuff all that. has a huge impact. Yeah. And then also to think that there isn't a lot of infrastructure that goes into trails and roads and campgrounds that isn't coming f like to appease these outdoor right. recreators. Right. They very much have an impact on the landscape and a demand on the resources to the public agencies who whose land they're recreating on, whether it's federal lands, state lands, county lands, you know. But it's just like, yeah, it's it's really interesting to have that sentiment um, that like, oh, well, I'm not having an impact on the resource. I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't right. have to pay for my recreation. Yeah. So. And you've heard me say this before, Marcus, that I often wondered if the Pittman-Robertson Act came about today, would the hunting, shooting, community and our representatives in industry, would we support it? Right. And I often said, I don't know. Well, this bill reaffirms my faith that we would do it because right. who's leading the charge on this? Every hunting group I know of. Yep. All the shooting groups that have any relevancy in the industry. The industry of the shooting and hunting world is the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Right. That's their lobbying group that they, that's where they bring their collective voice. And these are the people who are being subjected to that tax. Yeah. And they went to Congress in the last two weeks and said, you guys are idiots. <laughs> who the hell came up with this dumb idea? Yeah. So that should be some serious writing on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who wants to say that even today hunters aren't on board with this excise tax or shooters. Yeah. You're crazy. Look who's up there trying to kill this bill. Yeah. And that's one thing, whether or not, I, I like to, it's hard to think that they would self-impose an 11% tax, but I think in general, you're right that hunters and shooters and sportsmen, I guess, hunters, anglers, the sportsmen in general are more passionate mm -hmm. about these causes than the average hiker. And I'm not saying like there's backpackers and hikers who aren't also passionate, but no, they are. when yeah. you see people that show up to when there are significant changes being, you know, mm -hmm. introduced for public lands, for wildlife, for fisheries, whatever it might be, sportsmen show up to the table, it seems like a much higher rate than yep. a lot of the other user groups. Yeah. And so in that respect, it, it, it's yeah. definitely true. So I would say if you are somebody who buys products in the outdoor recreation space from those well-known companies, those well-known groups, that service that space, ask them where they are at. 
Why are they trying to kill legislation anytime it comes forward that would help fund some of those impacts? I don't know why. Well, I know why, but I'm not gonna <laughs> you know, dive into that. But the point is, or your point, is illustrated really well. Here we have an attack on something that we in the hunting and shooting space said, tax us. Right. We want to pay our way. We want to pay as much as we can. And over here, in contrast, we have another group that wants to hide behind the idea of tariffs or we're not consumptive users. Yep. I rest my case. No, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting history of how that's all come to be. And hopefully this return act is, is done. I think, I, it, I think it will be, but... Uh, and for, well, those, for those who haven't seen it, go read it because your legislator, your representative might be one of the 50 people, like my representative is one of the 50 some people sponsoring this and he has heard from me. Go let him know. Here's the other part of this. I know some of this is posturing, right? Right, it is, yeah. We, sure. we know it's just BS posturing. But we need to let these people know that taking our issues of conservation, clean air, clean water, access, public lands, those were never political footballs. And here they are grabbing this and say, let's go make some political hay with this. Yeah. Just the principle of that, the, the process of doing that and forcing that to happen, they need to hear about it and say, hands off, quit this stupid stuff. You got way better things to spend your time on. You, you, if this is a priority issue, I, I, I don't know how this could make it in the priority of all the things I could see Congress could work on. Right. So quit it. <laughs> we don't need this stuff to be political games. I think that's a great point to end the deeper dive on. Thanks for uh, the insight. Yeah. Thanks for having me. If people want to let us know anything else, they can email us at weekly at freshtracks.tv. Thanks for watching.